Everybody take out a piece of paper, put your name at the top, and number it from 1 to 20, please. <laughs> kind of brings a flashback, doesn't it? Kind of like, oh my God, what do I do now? Words to send panic in the hearts. Nobody, nobody likes a test. Unless you're a school teacher, and apparently you like tests because they gave them all the time. Of course, taking tests are not just for school, are they? We can take all kinds of tests. Your doctor says, I want to run some tests. And that put panic in your heart in a whole different kind of way. Because that implies that something is not right. And then they're going to come after you with a needle in your eye. <laughs> Speaking of eye, I had an eye exam the other day. And that's a different kind of test. And apparently I need new glasses now. Because I'm getting old. We got to take a test to get a driver's license. We have days when our patience is tested. Times that test our endurance. We can take all kind of tests in this life, don't we? What does it mean to take a test? What does it mean to be tested? Well, it's a means of evaluation, really. It implies that there is a standard and the test is to determine whether or not you are meeting the standard. Does the student know the things that he's supposed to know? Do your livers and your kidney and all those things work the way that they're supposed to work? Evaluate your compliance. And the tests, well, they're not always easy to endure. Sometimes they're downright difficult, but they are necessary. We got to know where we stand. We got to know how the body is functioning. We got to know if the student meets the requirements. The tests help us to grow and gain wisdom. They make us stronger and healthier in the mind and in the body and in the soul. Disciples, hear me now. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tested in this life. You will have challenges that come your way. Difficulties. And the Lord God Almighty who loves you and desires great things for you sometimes will give you some tests so that you can know where you stand. So that you can know who you are. Check your character. Check your soul. Every day you'll face a test. And here's the test. The real test is this, Christian. Do my actions and my behavior match my faith? Am I talking the talk or am I walking the walk? As we all know, talk is cheap. The test is, do our lives line up with the authority of the word? And that's tough. And no, we don't always do it perfectly. But on the whole, and on the balance of things, we need to be consistent and faithful in our faith. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and finish our discussion of the Beatitudes. Remember we talked about this last week a little bit? The Beatitudes are a blessing, a state of being that brings joy in the soul, that brings peace into our lives. And if you remember, we made a word play about the Beatitudes. These are some attitudes that you can be. The root of the word is a whole different thing. But by doing and living and being with these kinds of attitudes in an authentic way, we will end up with a greater sense of joy in our lives. The overwhelming message in the first half of the Beatitudes is that of genuine humility. Not play acting, not making it look good on the outside, but honest and heartfelt and genuine action in the soul. True behavior of humility and meekness and embracing our own brokenness before God. And that would be so easy to do if it weren't for all these other people in the world, 
If it weren't for the tests and the challenges and the difficulties that we knew, oh, it'd be simple to be meek and humble and all those things. But then all these other people come into my life and test me and bring out the worst in me. And sometimes humility is hard to come by. So the second half of the Beatitudes relates to the one another's. All these other bothersome people that test me and try me. So, Matthew 5, verses 7 through 10. Would you stand, please, that we would honor the reading of God's Word. Jesus is speaking on the mountainside, and he continues by saying, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, God, help us to see the truth of your word and help us, so much more importantly, to apply it to our lives and to live by it, that we would experience your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Be seated, please. I think that September 11th, 2001 was a defining moment for a generation. In the same way that President Kennedy's assassination or Pearl Harbor stands out for some of you, for people my age anyway, that was the pivotal moment of our time in history. The world shifted, nothing will ever be the same. And we know that. And we all remember the day and staring at the television and watching the news and then the towers fell and the Pentagon and the other plane in Pennsylvania and it was just mayhem and horror. And the nation that we love is under attack. And there were the scenes of dust and smoke and debris all over New York City. And all the emergency rooms were empty because everybody was dead. Heartbreaking. About two days later, I remember seeing the president, George Bush, standing on that pile of rubble talking to the first responders with a megaphone in his hand. Do you remember that? And he said, we will find out who did this and we will bring them to justice. And the whole country said, oh, you better, be you better believe it. So we did. We've launched into this war on terror in our quest for justice. And we dismantled a terrorist regime and destabilized a region. And now we have another and more extreme terrorist regime. It's continuing to wreak havoc. And we see that guy on TV dressed in black with a knife in his hand and a poor soul in an orange jumpsuit on his knees. And we cry out, what is wrong with you people? Why won't you show any mercy? Look at verse 7. <clears throat> Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. That'll kind of stare you in the face, won't it? And I know, they began this war. I understand that. And there's no reasoning with crazy people that are bent on violence and we can't and sit and do nothing and let evil have its way. I get all that. I do. When we are the ones who have been hurt and offended and injured, when we are the ones who have been done wrong, the first thing we want is justice. And we demand justice, and we cry out for justice, and we go and seek justice. But when we're on the other end of it, when we are the ones facing loss, when you are the one that is threatened, When it's your kid facing time in jail, you will cry for mercy. 
You will beg for mercy. Perhaps the Lord waits for us to show mercy first before we can obtain mercy. And if we want to receive our share of mercy in this world, maybe we need to initiate. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's why fundamentalism doesn't work whether it's Islamic or Christian or otherwise, the fundamentalists, the rigid and the dogmatic and the legalists are more concerned about religious behavior and being right and pointing the finger of condemnation at everybody else. And one day soon they will so desperately seek the grace that they deny. Matthew 7, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, it was the judgment you used, you will be judged. And that goes for individuals like you and I, and organizations, and perhaps even nations as well. God is merciful to us in ways that we do not deserve. He is generous in mercy and forgiveness. And if he were not, the only other choice we would have is his justice. Do you really want God's justice for your sin? And yet we are so quick to demand justice from the people around us. Let's go on to verse 8. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart. And I don't know about you, but I sure want to see God someday. Think about the joy that awaits for us and the promises of eternity and glory. I want to bow in worship before Him. And I want to put my face in the dirt before Him and praise Him and fall to my knees and give Him the glory that He is entitled to. Oh, I want to see God. I want to sit before his throne. And I certainly don't want any part of the alternative to not see God. To be cast out into the lake of burning fire. And for all eternity, remember those chances I had to humble myself and confess my sin. And to know that there is no chance in forever. And no reprieve. I want to see God. But I know too, I'm not always so pure of heart. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll know that that's true for you too. I know that there lurks something within me that's dark and vicious and not right and opposed to God. Even as a saved and born again person, even as a minister of the gospel, I know that my heart is not always so pure. And sometimes that darkness rears its ugly head and I say and do things that do not honor God. After David's sin with Bathsheba, you're familiar with that episode from 2 Samuel, he cried out to God, Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Purge me with hyssop, and then I will be clean. If you wash me, God, then I will be whiter than snow. See, I don't have a whole lot of purity in me. It's God's grace and love and mercy and forgiveness that purifies us. In the natural, in the self, I cannot be right with God and I cannot be pure before Him. And when the tests come my way and those difficult and challenging circumstances and people come into my life and test my patience and cause me conflict, that impurity of heart 
sometimes gets revealed in me, doesn't it? You know that. You helped reveal it sometimes. Born again by faith, it is God's declaration of purity that saves us. It is God's proclamation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has declared you saved and righteous and born again. And only he can do it. And all of our purity and our renewal is in him. But then in practical, everyday ways, growing in grace in this path of discipleship, these trials come into us and they reveal those flaws in our soul. And they reveal those impurities that we carry. And that comes. I'm sure you've had some people that come into your life and just have a way of bringing out the worst in you. You know what I'm talking about? We've all had somebody like that. Now, dig this. If you're shallow and foolish, what you'll do is blame them for all the trouble that they cause you. And you get mad at them. But if you're wise, if you're truly a disciple of Christ, you will allow that difficulty to reveal those worst parts of you. And it exposes all that dark matter. And then you do something about it. And you take some real self-assessment. And you allow those hardships to come and help refine your soul. And you grow in grace. And you come out a little bit better. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, sometimes the difficulties and the tests and the challenges we face help us to see the impurities of our heart and enable us to grow and gain wisdom and strength. And it becomes a learning experience. So when I say I want to be pure in heart before the Lord, that is an invitation to you to help me see my own impurities. Help me see the flaws in my own soul. And I got to tell you, sometimes that's no fun at all. That's hard to do. Think about it this way. If you had a piece of wood, rough cut block of wood full of splinters and burrs and gouges. But you get some 60 grit sandpaper and you get after that thing, right? And it starts to smooth out. And then you get some 100 grit sandpaper and it refines it a little bit more. And then maybe some 220 and you wear away all those rough edges. Now if the block of wood had some feelings, it might protest. It might complain and say, this is not fun at all. I don't like this. It might even run away if it had legs. But the craftsman... The carpenter, the one from Nazareth, keeps sanding away all those rough edges so that the beauty of the wood will be exposed. Get rid of all the things that we don't need and bring out the very best. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Moving on to verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. Way back in 1872, a fellow named Samuel Colt got a new patent for a new kind of handgun. The famous Colt 45. The gun that won the West. And it was called a peacemaker. I'm just giving you some history. I don't think that's the kind of peace that Jesus has in mind. Peace through superior firepower looks really good on a t-shirt, but in practice it doesn't really work because peace is not made through oppression. Peace is made through compassion and mutual understanding and reconciliation and restoration and even mercy. 
Notice, too, that Jesus did not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Because that's two whole different propositions. Being a peacekeeper implies that there is a peace in the beginning of it. And all you got to do is keep it that way. Everybody steady as she goes. Everybody behave and we'll be fine. But a peacemaker implies that there is a conflict already. And you got to do something about it. Being a peacekeeper is passive and you sit back and you watch. Being a peacemaker is active. And it implies that you have to enter into the midst of the conflict. And that's hard to do. Jesus was a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. Jesus came to enter into our conflicted and difficult world. He entered into a battlefield and he turned it right side up. Jesus came to make our peace with God. And did he fight the way of superior firepower? Did he fight with oppression and demands and put everybody in their place and swords and chariot and force and aggression? No. He made peace through sacrifice. He made peace by saying no to hatred and repression and sin and by saying yes to mercy and grace. And he was obedient to his father's will even to the point of his own death. He gave all that he had for the peace of other people. Remarkable. And because he loves us, because he sacrificed all that he had for us, we do not remain as we are in our headstrong and self-centered ways. We change and we grow because we know better. And by his example, we too must be willing to surrender and sacrifice for the common cause of peace. In these days of testing, in these times of challenge, you will be required to give of yourself. You'll be required to set aside your pride. You'll be required to endure some agony. It will cost you. But blessed are the peacemakers. And you know, very often the world just doesn't understand. The world in which we live does not understand what it means to live as peacemakers. The world doesn't understand the, the power of mercy and grace. And when we live as people of mercy, when we live as peacemakers, and we enter into the conflict to help others, what happens? Oh, they take advantage of us, and they abuse us, and we get ridiculed and call the fool, and the world turns against. Which brings us to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verses 11 and 12 reiterate that. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. And they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Because when you show mercy in the face of hatred... You will be shamed on this earth and abused and walked over and taken advantage of. And they will return your mercy with contempt and violence. And when you humble yourself before the haters and the ones that test your patience and try your character and you allow yourself to be tested and sometimes you fail, they will mock you and ridicule you and belittle you. And when you insert yourself in the center of warring parties to be a peacemaker, sometimes you're going to walk away with a black eye and a fat lip. Guaranteed. And I think Jesus smiles at that. And I think he is exceptionally proud of his people. When we sacrifice of ourselves for the common cause of peace in this world. 
And if we are humbled and surrendered to God and live by his strength and act in his grace to show love and goodness and hope in the midst of darkness and violence and hatred, sometimes, on occasion, the power of God is revealed. And someone will learn that there is a better way. And you and I have the high privilege of representing the Lord Almighty on his earth. So when the world lines up to test you, when the world lines up to take a shot at you, usually in the back, Jesus says rejoice and be glad and represent me well. Because you are joining a long line of people who have chosen the better path. The prophets of the Old Testament were abused and rejected because they spoke the truth of God. The Savior was not crucified because he was a nice guy. But instead he challenged the assumptions and he challenged the religious notions and expectations. And he challenged the status quo of sinful and broken humanity. And oh, they couldn't stand it. We say we know God so well. We say we love Jesus with all our heart. But then scriptures like these come along. His words, duly recorded by Matthew for all time. And even these words test us and challenge us and give us a standard to live by. Hmm. How do we respond to that? This test is not like those others. Those other tests are come and go. But this is the test that matters. Will you submit yourself to the Word of God and live and walk in faith even when it's hard to do? Or will you do what comes natural, take the easy way, do what's popular, Convince yourself of your own rightness and righteousness and charge forward. Will you fight back and resist with all your strength against the difficulty of this world? Or will you trust in God and worship God and honor God by seeking your blessings and your peace in Him? That's the test. Good luck on your exam, because it starts as soon as you walk out that door this morning. Father God, you are awesome in every way. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us to be people of mercy. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us, Lord, to be pure in heart. Help us to withstand this world that does not know you. Because, Lord, when we represent you, they line up and they take their shots and we suffer loss. Let us be complete in Christ. Let us be found in you, O oh Lord. And may your name and your truth and your goodness be magnified in your people. Give us a passion and a compassion for you in this broken world. And we will give you praise forever. In Jesus' name, amen. We close this morning with a time of invitation. What's God saying to you this morning? And what burdens and troubles and persecutions do you have that you need to lay down at the altar and surrender before him? I invite you to come. Kneel at the altar. Pour it out to the Lord. I invite you to come. I'm happy to pray with you about whatever is on your heart and mind today. But know this, God loves you and he has great plans for you and your life. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, you are missing out. Would you stand, please? Be born again today.